We're here at Plage de Trolloan in the uh, west coast of Brittany to have a look at the dune system here and to think about how the dunes are formed, um, right up to how they're managed and how people can have an effect on them. Um, dunes, well, first of all, to get a dune formed, you need three things to be in place. You need, first of all, you need sand, because without sand there won't, wouldn't be a dune. You also need the space to put the sand, so the accommodation space. And then you need the wind, the weather conditions, to be able to pick up the sand, to move it and to deposit it. And the way that the sand is moved by, is by three different methods or mechanisms. First one is if the wind is strong enough, it can actually pick the sand up and blow it along in suspension, something we call suspended transport. However, if the wind isn't strong enough to, to keep it in suspension, then it may be able to get the grains to hop up into the air um, and then to bounce on the ground again and they might hop up again in a sort of a, a leapfrog sort of motion across the beach and up into the dunes. And that's something we call saltation. And the third mechanism by which sand can move is when uh, the wind is just strong enough to move it uh, along the ground uh, as a blanket, if you like, something we call surface creep. Now, when the, the sand is moving by any, any one of those three mechanisms, it will only come to stop and be deposited when the wind velocity that's transporting it decreases. And that, that can occur um, when the sand uh, uh, encounters an obstacle, like a strand line at the back of the beach composed of driftwood, uh, seaweed, maybe the odd dead dolphin or so. And the sand can then be deposited in the lee side uh, and sometimes also on the upwind uh, side of the object to start creating an accumulation of sand, um, something we call a shadow dune. And at this point, the shadow dune doesn't have any vegetation on it. It's just sand around a particular piece of debris. But if the sand accumulates enough and it gets above the, the, the influence of the waves, then vegetation can actually start to colonize that shadow dune to produce then what we call an embryo dune. And an embryo dune can be a very small, uh, round, circular um, accumulation of sand with a bit of tufty vegetation on it, uh, centered on a piece of debris. But eventually, if it's along a strand line, these individual embryo dunes, uh, through a continued accumulation of sand uh, and, and the, the increased trapping ability of the vegetation, they can actually start to coalesce and to merge uh, along the, the strand line. So you have these uh, merging, coalescing uh, embryo dunes, which eventually produce a linear dune feature, and it occurs right at the front of the dunes. Uh, and because of that, we call it the fore dune. Now, once a fore dune has been created, you can have another strand line uh, be deposited by waves in front of it, and the whole, the whole uh, process can start all over, like, uh, all over again, producing another fore dune in front of the older fore dune. And in this way, if sediment supply is, is constant, and continuous, then we can have a whole number, a whole series of four dunes uh, growing out seaward uh, from the original position. And we call that process dune progradation. So the dunes can prograde out towards the sea if the sediment availability is high enough. Now once that happens, the old four dune that's left behind uh, becomes what we call a hind dune. It's behind the four dune, so we call it a hind dune. And the four dune is the one at the front. Now eventually, with progradation, those hind dunes are going to become more and more ever distant from the beach and the source of sediment. So they become effectively starved of sediment. When that happens, they are vulnerable to uh, incision uh, and disturbance, perhaps by rabbits burrowing, by goats or sheep grazing, or indeed tourists walking across the beach, across the dunes rather, to the beach uh, and incising pathways, as, as we have here. When that happens, the uh, wind can actually get into those pathways and start to undercut the dune on either side, uh, um, releasing the, the sand from underneath the, the vegetation, in which case we, we have here marram grasses and sedges. Um, the sand is liberated and can be blown through the midland. And in this way, in these fine dunes, the sand can be transported from the dune ridge to behind the fragments that are left. And so the whole uh, dune can be reorientated from what was parallel to the coast to actually become uh, perpendicular to the coast at right angles. And we, when that happens, we call those secondary dunes because they're no longer in their original orientation. And of course, 
when they are in their original orientation, we call those primary dunes because they're in their primary position. So by looking at from the air at a dune system, the dunes that are still parallel to the coast are primary dunes. Those that have been re reorientated through sand starvation and blowout formation and, in, and undercutting through uh, deflation by the wind, they become uh, perpendicular and they are the secondary dunes. So there's a whole evolutionary uh, process going on there with, uh, with, with sand dunes.